Hello and welcome to Clegan's webinar. Um, Pop Reach 67, Prop 65, IATA in Canada. Lesser known high impact uh, legislations. My name is Bruce Calder. I'm the VP of Consulting Services here at Clegan. Today is going to be packed. I mean packed, I mean really packed. We're going to go over a lot of lesser known legislations that are high impact. High impact for us are, are legislations that are enforced and can be business affecting. Business affecting for us are things that can stop ship or public exposure or mass or very significant fines or lawsuits, things that are business affecting. Now we're going through five topics today, so it's gonna be a bit brief. So a lot of material, the idea is to be 50 minutes long with some Q&A at the end, we hope we'll stay in schedule. Um, it's going to be a lot of material. Uh, we're gonna be lacking in detail in some cases where we're really gonna be tacking, tackling the salient points. So we're gonna start with POP. Especially short chain chlorinated paraffins, explain the Stockholm Convention, uh, talk about recalls, risks, and then the Canadian variant of it. And what, what is the salient business affecting part of the Canadian prohibition of certain toxic substances. We'll talk reach seven, six, Article 67 restrictions, and we'll briefly talk about a number of them, but we're really going to look at asbestos and cadmium. We're going to talk about Prop 65 and be very practical on April prosecutions and what people are going after. We're going to talk about IATA lithium battery in extreme simplicity. So basically, look, if you're not looking into this, you really should, and this is exactly the main points, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. So it's intended to be 50 minutes long. It's going to be dense. It's also going to be going a little fast. And I apologize for a lot of people out there. Um, it could be moving a little bit quickly. So there's going to be a lot of content. This is going to be a little bit different than normal. We're going into less detail on an individual regulation. We're going to be tackling the salient points. A lot of this is really to identify what you should be looking at. So um, the regulation we're looking at are not as well known, um, but they're high risk of business affecting events. We're going to be tackling the, the really salient points. So there's a lot of material to cover. Uh, again, we're focused on the main key points of why you should be paying attention to this legislation. We have so many people are paying attention very much to ROHS and to reach SVHC, which is good, um, but POP is, is a bigger risk than either. Um, due to the time, some of the depth we're missing often in these webinars, we go into significant depth on a regulation in practice. We're really tackling again, uh, can't stress enough, the salient points. This is really why you should be paying attention to what the risks are. And here are some examples. Of what the problem is. So the, the purpose here is really to make sure that the people at least have some awareness of some of the lesser known regulations that can stop their shipments, can our business affecting. Um, so it's going to be going pretty fast uh, through a lot of this. If any questions, please feel free to contact us afterwards. There will be a Q&A at the end. Um, I have a slight time constraint, so I won't get to as many questions as I'd like to today. I'll try to get to as many as possible. If I don't get to yours, please feel free to contact me afterwards. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Okay, first of all, we're going to talk about short chain chlorinated paraffins, SCCPs, which not everybody here may have heard of, but they should. Um, this is related to the EU persistent organic pollutants regulation. So one of the big things talking about people like what substances are going to be restricted in the future. Up until now, most restricted substances are one of two groups. They're either car uh, carcinogens to cause cancer, like lead, or the reproductive toxins, like the phthalates. So most restricted substances, whether ROHS or other regulations, are primarily have been up until now virtually completely carcinogens or reproductive toxins. Persistent organic pollutants are one of the two new categories. So uh, going forward, a lot of the new substances you re see restricted are persistent organic pollutants. They're the chemicals that persist in the environment, build up, and eventually cause harm to flora and fauna. The one that's really critical here is around regula EU Regulation 880. 850, 2004. It's been around a long time, but the, the really important piece is the update that happened in November of 2015, 2015 uh, update for SCCPs. SCCPs were given a limit of 0.15% by weight in articles, which, and without another court case, you'd assume it's the reach SVHC different, a definition, which is at a component level. So there's a max of 0.15% SCCPs in articles. It is easily one of the top causes of EU product recalls for restricted materials, or recalls in general. There are basically 10 SCCP recalls for every ROHS one. Put that in perspective. It's a big deal. It's primarily in vinyl and PVC, but also neoprene, uh, nitrile rubber, uh, Buna S, styrene rubber, cellulose acetate, all the same materials that are high risk for phthalates. It's often a secondary plasticizer in parallel with the phthalates. 
Uh, very, very common and inexpensive. You, you're going to, if you really want to catch it easily, you just go down to a, your typical dollar store and buy some PVC or vinyl materials. Where it all comes from is the UN Stockholm Convention. The UN Stockholm Convention has no power over you or any company, but it the only power it has over you is if a country ratifies it and puts it into the legislation. Once it's ratified, then it can have bearing on you. Now, this is a, a convention signed by well over 100 countries. It was just updated about two weeks ago. Inside of it, until recently, it's changed again two weeks ago, I'll explain that, um, there are restrictions on persistent organic pollutants. And one of the key restrictions are sometimes specific substances are restricted in articles where short-chain chlorinated paraffins will come up. And the way the restriction works is they're banned in articles and less trace. And it's up to the country to identify what trace is. So there'll be different PPM levels potentially in different countries. We'll explain that. But the ratifying countries, the ones that are ratified the convention, will have restrictions for these persistent organic pollutants. They've committed to it, and if they put it into legislation, they're going to have restrictions. So this is going to be one of the few restrictions that you're going to see implemented globally. ROHS is not as harmonized or implemented globally. It's a handful of countries with, with similar. This one's different. This one you'll see a lot more of common implementations. Now, why is it really a big deal? Because it actually gets recalls. This is, uh, we're going to show a whole bunch from Europe, and we're going to go a bit fast. I apologize for the speed. By the way, this one, this product happens to be an ROHS withdrawal from market also. It had leaded solder on the board. But ROHS recalls are actually relatively rare. ROHS uh, enforcement is actually normally handled through a different method, which we can explain at a different time. Um, so this is a retro Nintendo controller. Uh, you might be able to see down the bottom left that uh, USB cable. The outer jacket of the USB cable is 1.9% SCCPs. Withdrawal from market, sort of equivalent uh, from um, as a recall. Extension cable, horrible picture. Love Finland. Very, not very good in Norway. Not a very good picture. Good at about a force, but not good at pictures. It's an it's an extension cable. It's the outer jacket of the extension cable. The power cable is 4.7% SCCPs. Pulled off the market. Uh, another one from 2016-2017, a thermometer. It's the little cable at the bottom, which you can barely see. It's a little plug-in cable. Very simple connector, PVC cable, outer jacket, 1.1% SCCPs. Off the market. Uh, this was a throw-in USB cable. Somebody threw in a USB cable at their product. Um, the outer jack of the USB cable, 0.25%. Again, the, the limit's 0.15 or 1,500 ppm in the uh, EU. Uh, this is Sweden this time. By the way, you notice that each one's a different country. A lot of them are Scandinavian, but this is actually fairly commonly enforced uh, across the EU. Off the market, uh, recall. And the, by the way, the recall is only the worst case. There are a number of others where they've come to an arrangement with the manufacturer that did not require publication. So the actual amount of real enforcement is about five times larger. Uh, again, great. nice enforcement, not the best picture. It's a kettle. It's the uh, power cord for the kettle, the outer jacket, again, PVC, outer jacket, the power cable, 3.6% SCCP off the market. Um, this is a different kind, and this is actually more vulnerable to a lot of companies. It's This is a, um, a nursing, breastfeeding pillow. It's not the pillow. It's that soft vinyl packaging you see around it. That soft vinyl packaging, by the way, this applies to all articles, so packaging counts. That soft vinyl packaging around it is 6% SCCPs. Norway this time, off the market. So it's not the breastfeeding pillow, it's the outer packaging. Again, another recall. By the way, this is just a handful of the uh, uh, recalls. Uh, hammer. Um, like we see for phthalates, big risk in the hammer of the in the handle. Um, the soft rubber vinyl handle, SCCP. So I also had polyaromatic, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PHs, which is a reach issue. Talk about later. Handles are used frequently hoop in contact. Um, but the main one we're talking about here is SCCPs. Um, SCCP issue. Again, cheap vinyl. By the way, so it's any products. Not human contact is any content because this is about persistence in the environment. So it's another one. Handle. Off the market, 0.28%. So a lot of companies are spending a lot of time working about lead, and there's a good reason. Uh, there are still lots of ROHS failures out there. It's still very, very common. Um, but this one is heavily enforced. It is more enforced than ROHS from a recall point of view. Um, it's very prevalent. The supply chain does not often control this as well. Many times you ask the supplier, and they go, what are you talking about? And there's a high risk. 
For example, in December of 2016, Kemi, the Swedish enforcement agency, so relatively recently actually published, did a, a very much more significant uh, enforcement. They test 154 high-risk products and for ROHS and POP. And POP, they mean SCCPs. So SCCPs and ROHS, they tested 154 products. They had 58 failures, 38% failure rate, which is not unexpected for both ROHS and POP. Um, the tables, and there was a link on the previous page, you'll have it. Uh, the tables are in Swedish, but you can mostly figure them out. You can see on the right the failure types. We're looking at lead in PVC. By the way, lead in PVC is still very common. Uh, SCCPs. Now, they have DH mentioned here. DHP, DH was not actually in these products of, uh, a restriction. It's a communication requirement, but they do reference it. So you can see the SCCP failures. You can see the lead failures is a typical uh, any J or NEJ means no, they didn't fail. But the, the, this is a very typical failure rate. They have SCCPs, um, they have phthalates, they have lead. Um, this is not abnormal. <clears throat> now, not S SCCPs and lead were not always together, but it's not uncommon for cheap PVC to also have lead. Lead PVC is not thermally stable. Um, the way you stabilize PVC, the cheap way is lead. Now it's more often a zinc or tin uh, compounds. Um, but we still see lead in PVC relatively common, especially in cheaper materials. So when we test in the lab, um, we test for SCCPs all the time. When we test in 2016, when we test the high risk materials, so we don't bother testing SCCPs in materials that can't have SCCPs. So if we test PVC or neoprene or nitrile rubber or SBR, uh, same sort of materials that contain phthalates, when we test for SCCPs, we get a 4% failure rate in 2016. So over the entire year, uh, hundreds of tests, 4% um, failure rate. It's really common. And if you look at the amount of PVC or vinyl in your typical product, you go, well, you know what? That actually a 4% failure rate is a lot. So it's a very high risk issue. It's a stop ship issue in EU and Canada. And we'll talk about Canada in a second. So right now, today, it's a stop ship in the EU. And we'll talk about Canada in a second. It's, it's off the market. It's a stop ship. You're not allowed. Um, it's quite strict. It's just not allowed. So 4% failure rate includes professional products. This applies to medical, industrial, consumer, everybody. It, there isn't exemptions for it. There's one exemption for one application in mining, but that's it. So when we test for it, we test for it all the time. Uh, it's 4% failure rate for high-risk parts. By the way, it's also restricted in Canada. Canada is a really interesting uh, legislative environment. Um, there are two houses of government in Canada. However, one house appoints the other house. So fundamentally, it's a one-house government, so if there's a majority like there is today, they can make any law they want, but they generally don't. The only laws that Canada implements in this space, which is very few and far between, um, there's stuff you can buy in Canada that you can buy in China. But the stuff they, they implement uh, in Canada, if they sign a convention like Stockholm for persistent organic balloons, like Minamata for mercury, they always implement it because they have no real checks and balances. They, the government, the federal government, can implement any law they want as long as they don't break the constitution. But they generally don't. In this case, when they sign a when they sign a UN convention, they do carry through. So pop, they've implemented. They have a ban on short chain chlorinated alkanes. Why they have a different name than everyone else, I don't know. When they talk to the outside world, they call it SCCPs or short chain chlorinated paraffins. But inside their own legislation, it's short chain chlorinated alkanes. Maybe it's just to be different. They also say, we don't have a limit. It's not allowed to be there unless trace or incidental. So what's the PPM limit? They say, we don't have one. Can't be trace or incidental. Have you ever tried to specify it to a non-English supplier? Yeah, the limit is trace or incidental. It's semantics. They're like, what's the PPM limit? Good point. So when in doubt, we normally recommend using the European limit because the European says 0.15% is trace or incidental. Who are we to actually disagree? So they don't actually have a limit. We use the European one because if the Europe says that's tracer incidental, they should be more knowledgeable than we are anyways. Let's use that level. But it is a ban. So in, in North America, if we're dealing with a stop ship for restricted materials, there aren't a lot of material restrictions of the mercury in, in North America. It's primarily for SCCPs, often for cables or other materials. It's a relatively common issue. So if you're looking at a North American stop ship issue, you're looking at SCCPs. If you're looking at a European stop issue, SCCPs is one of the major ones. So this is one of those lesser known legislations, persistent organic pollutant, but it can stop you from shipping, both in Canada and the EU. It's a big deal. And you saw from Europe, it's actually relatively enforced. Canada enforcement, they have very good intentions. They have lovely statements about enforcement. They're a little weak on doing it. 
So as I said, this is going to be going at a fairly hmm, fast pace because a lot of material to cover. I apologize for that. Also, there's some limitations to depth. When we talked about we're going to do Canadian pro pro uh, prohibition of certain toxic substance regulation, we're only talking about the saline part. There are a variety of other restrictions which generally don't apply to almost any product of anybody here today, except for the SCCP one. So the SCCP one is a big deal. So when you when you, the Canadian prohibition of certain toxic substances, e arguably the most confusingly written regulation of all time, well, at least in this space. It's scattered, it's in many amendments, it's not centralized, it's very difficult, a lot of semantics. The thing to focus on is short chain chlorinated paraffins. That's 98% of your risk. Moving along to back to Europe again. Reach Article 60, 67. So a lot of people focus, especially in, in the professional products, about Reach SVHCs, Article 33, the communication requirement. There are materials restrictions also in Reach. They're related to the, the previous dangerous substances directive, which Reach uh, superseded. There are materials restrictions inside reach, separate. Now many of them are for consumer products, but not all of them. Some of them are broad based. So there's a number of consumer ones like phthalates and toys, PAHs in prolonged repeat human contact, um, nickel in prolonged human contact. We're not going to go into those much today, but they're actually are a big deal. You make a wearable, nickel is your world. If you want to see why a wearable has a recall, it's nickel. Nickel's a big deal. Um, but pHs in prolonged human contact, like we saw with that, uh, the handle of the hammer, we saw the recall in SCCPs, it's really a contaminant that can be in black, carbon black or the black pigment agent in, uh, plastics. Uh, but we're going to talk mostly about asbestos and cadmium. People are like, oh, don't worry, I don't have asbestos. Wrong. You'd be shocked how often you have asbestos. So, cadmium first. Uh, there are restrictions. Uh, obviously in electronics already, but REACH has a lot more restrictions outside electronics. So when we're dealing with ROHS, you're used to having a cadmium restriction of 100 ppm. Um, there are more restrictions. There's a link here. It's quite broad. There's a lot of them. We're going to talk here about some of the most important ones. There are more. Uh, painted articles. Can't have cadmium above 0.1% by weight in the paint. Plastics. <clears throat> it has a specific list of synthetic organic polymers that cannot have cadmium. It's virtually every single plastic you could think of cannot have cadmium. Cadmium plating also can't have it. <coughs> cadmium jewelry also can't have it. I'm not going to go in. Uh, jewelry can't have cadmium either. I'm not going to go into it as much here. I'm worried about more plating. Where we actually see cadmium, believe it or not, is in plating. One of the mistakes in the ROHS test standards is there is not a good test standard today for cadmium in surface. There's one for hexachrome, which is okay-ish um, in surface. Okay-ish, but there's not a good one for cadmium. And so a lot of times, cadmium plated, which is often nickel plated, uh, the way you make nickel bright is you add cadmium to it. So bright nickel has often got cadmium in it. It's a surface, it's a coating, it's non-compliant. There's not a good test standard for it. If it's tested in Asia, it gets ground up and ICP'd. The weight of that cadmium in the surface coating, which is separate material, does not add up to 0.01% of the weight of the, um, the entire components, usually metal, uh, but it's a mistake. They really do need a 6 2, 3 to 1 standard for cadmium plating. It's an error and it gets through all the time. Uh, we do see it in colorants. Red means, used to mean cadmium. Cadmium red was how red was done since the dawn of time. It's got great color fastness. Everybody understands it. Not allowed now. You can't use red. But we see a red part, a red plastic part. Our lab gets excited because you know one in three times you probably have a cadmium failure. So it's all very exciting. Recalls. This is the shocking one, and we do see this. Cadmium in PVC. Why? I don't really know why, actually. For these things, I'm not sure why it's used. Cadmium is not uncommon in PVC, especially cheap PVC. I think PVC, you could put everything in it. So PVC itself is not bad, but somehow managed to get virtually every bad thing it can in it at some point in its history. Um, this cadmium packaging, plastic packaging has... Uh, 500 ppm cadmium, fail for reach, recall. It's not the thing inside here. It's that, that not the laptop case. It's the, again, the soft PVC bag, which could have phthalates in it, or SCCPs, or lead, or cadmium in this case. Um, it's a magical substance, PVC. So this is not atypical. We do see at least once a month cadmium in PVC. It's like, what? PVC can have cadmium? PVC can have pretty well anything. Uh, PVC can have bisphenol A. It's an amazing substance. 
Another PVC packaging. It's not the little snake toy inside. It's the packaging again. PVC packaging, 570 ppm, 0.05% cadmium, off the market. It's not the little cheap, vivid insect. It's actually the PVC bag again. It's Finland again. Uh, this one's Spain. This is actually this is actually one for toy safety, but it does bring up the problem. Um, they got cadmium in a number of the different dyes. Now the dark blue is a bit odd. Uh, there must be some red pigment. Normally cadmium is really in there because of the red pigment, pink, purple, etc. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, um, cadmium in it. So Winnie the Pooh can give you testicular cancer. Uh, it's a bit more exciting than I normally want my pencil crayon. Um, but we see it all the time. Now in this particular case, there's there's some restrictions in in toys and art for zinc. Um, that's a different story. Mostly we're looking at cadmium. So red is where we see cadmium. If we see a red or orange, uh, like a pelican case that's orange, if it's, not, if it's a knockoff special pelican case, we know we're going to see cadmium. So red, and this one's done by Spain, red, orange, yellow, very high risk of cadmium content. Uh, it's not well controlled in a lot of the industry. It makes a wonderful colorant. Uh, a lot of companies specify the plastic potentially in their products, but often they say then, the Pantone or the RGB or the color they want in there and not the specific dye. And sometimes you get what you get, which is cadmium. As you go to the lowest cost supplier, cheaper parts, uh, it'll get more exciting when you look at your, your dollar type stores, cadmium. That said, we do see cadmium in professional products, medical products, everything we've seen, the red, the PVC, professional products get it too. Uh, cadmium in jewelry. Uh, we want to show this more of an example of coating. It, it's actually saying it's in the jewelry. It's not. It's in the coating. Um, we see this a lot. Uh, definitely in electronics part, laboratory equipment, medical, IVD. We see cadmium in coatings all the time. And yes, there, the XRF technology can have some weaknesses around cadmium. So that's one of the reasons why better test standards are used. And we have some much better test standards and methodology and processes to handle it. Um, but cadmium in coatings, especially in nickel coatings, is not uncommon. It's actually relatively common. Uh, bright nickel can have cadmium. It's, it's a way you make nickel plating bright. Uh, cadmium can find a PVC, obviously red materials. Now, military ones, like on the one on the right, the, the coating on the right, that hex chrome cadmium coating, sure. The, there's some standard military outdoor coatings that looks like hex chrome and RX chrome are also cadmium, fine. But we do see in the one on the bottom, that bright nickel look. It can be done without cadmium, but it often has cadmium, even in products that are supposed to be ROHS compliant. So the one on the right, the classic cadmium coating on metals, it's the one that's also usually hex chrome. The one down below is actually your typical bright nickel and got cadmium in it, it's part of the coating. And the test standard, if they get tested in Asia, gets ground, the whole part gets ground up and they don't measure properly the fact that the cadmium is in the coating. Uh, red materials, orange materials, yellow materials, of course, cadmium, cadmium red is the the historic method for, for making red and PVC. So you showed earlier the cheap PVC, even that transparent vine, the vinyl cabinet. As I said before, going a little bit fast, uh, there's some limitation on much depth. Um, there are some subtleties around some of these. Okay, this is one of the subtleties. The EU has a broad restriction on asbestos, uh, particularly types of asbestos. Uh, I can't say some of these words, uh, the crocodile one, amosite, anthopylate, actinolite, tremolite, and chrysotile. The big ones are tremolite and chrysotile. The restriction is for intentionally added. However, the enforcement toys are on friable. Friable means not embedded. So friable are fibers or powders. So even though it says intentionally added, any enforcement we've seen, I don't think they cared. If it's friable, not embedded. So when Crayola crayons had it inside the wax matrix, that's not friable. It's, it's embedded. It's not an EU problem. It's an Australia restriction, not EU. Um, however, the one we see in talc all the time, that's friable. You could argue it's a contamination, but I don't think they'll care. It's a very, very high risk. It'd be a fun argument because once it's in talc, it can be airborne. It's friable. It's dangerous. They're probably not going to be very sympathetic. There's a lot of fear around asbestos. Is, is asbestos bad? Absolutely. and cause cancer, but... Uh, from the lab testing, you really need six days, six hours exposure a day um, for 20 days before you show the redness, which leads to the, the, the mutation in cancer. However, the, the panic and treatment of asbestos is very severe. Any asbestos, it'd be really difficult to try to justify asbestos use. 
even though it might not be intentionally, it could be a contaminant. I don't think the national authorities will care. It's one of those substances that people are afraid of. Now, this is a typical one. This is the one they go after all the time. I don't know why it's their thing. Sky lanterns. These are the like the Frozen movie, these lanterns you light and they float through the sky. Anyways, for some reason, they have asbestos in them. So they're due to recalls. Um, more of the enforcement's actually in Australia. We're using Europe as an example, the, the highest enforcement by a mile. We'll talk about them in this Australia. Uh, but in practice, what you're really looking for, we'll first talk about Australia and then what the real problem is. You're thinking, well, it's asbestos. I don't care. I don't have asbestos in my product. I have electronics. I don't use asbestos. Hmm, you'd be shocked. Um, asbestos, so Australia is stricter, and the reason why a lot of information is known is because of that. So it's banned in Europe. However, Australia is the one that's got pretty draconian about it. They found tons of products they're getting through, starting with your typical crayons. The door of the Explorer, crayons had asbestos embedded in. It's not friable, but it's still banned there. They started checking other things, and they're going, well, we got asbestos everywhere. So now if you're importing product into Australia, you have to provide enough evidence the broker believes you have a program to prevent asbestos. What was happening is during products during import in Australia, uh, brokers just checkboxing no asbestos without asking the manufacturer for any. Now you have to provide statements. Can you provide a statement? Probably. Uh, it's relatively easy. However, you may be shocked that your risk is actually very high. Where is the asbestos coming from? It's talc. Talc is magnesium silicon oxide. Asbestos is magnesium silicon oxide. They are very slight different crystal forms, same thing. Um, they're both soft rock. They're both uh, non-flammable. Um, Talc is used in many applications as a lubricant. We, we've seen it in power cords. I've seen it in other places where uh, it's great lubrication between other pieces of plastic for a variety of reasons. Uh, the most common location we see it is in power cords where the inner wires have been pulled through the outer wires um, because they can't use oil as lubricant because it could be flammable. They use talc. Industrial talc is often co-located with asbestos. So when they mine and grind the talc, there's asbestos in it. So when we test for asbestos in talc, we catch it about 10% of the time. So 10% of the time we see talc, and for many cases, very, very, very name brand type uh, products and companies and suppliers, not your cheap dollar store stuff, could be anybody. Um, we're finding um, asbestos in the talc. So you can't really see the picture very well. The wire below, it didn't actually fail, but it's a good example. Um, if you open up the outer jacket, you'll see this white powder in there. It's very, so it almost looks like a desiccant. It's not, it's talc. Uh, talc is silicon magnesium oxide. Asbestos is silicon magnesium oxide. They're just different crystal forms. It's a kind of a um, more advanced test. Yeah, because it's, it's ground up in powder form, you have to use a, tra a, a transmission electron microscope test. Um, but you can see the fibers. And we fail about 10% of the time when we see the talc powder. Talc very commonly has asbestos in it. It is not well controlled, and particularly in Asia where they don't have the asbestos restrictions. The talc and asbestos are co-located. They're the same basic crystal. They're very slight crystal variations of each other. Uh, silica, they're, both, they're all silicon magnesium oxide. Some have a bit of iron in it or calcium, but basically they're all silicon magnesium oxide. Um, it's really common. We've, in the last month or so, we've got hits with chrysotile and tremoline, two different asbestos. It's really common. It is a stop ship. And you could argue in Europe, it's only intentionally added and this is a contamination. I don't believe that's going to be a winnable argument in most cases. They're going to fight that one. Asbestos has a particular fear around it that is, is more significant than others, even in lead. So, big risk. So many people sign say, no, no, we don't have asbestos. Really? Have you checked? Do you have any talc? You'd be shocked. So again, I'm moving a little bit quickly. Uh, we don't have to do in the same depth as normal, making sure everything comes in in time. We have a lot to cover. Next one, Prop 65. Now this one I could talk, and I have had previous webinars. They can talk for hours on Prop 65, and it's a very exciting um, regulation in many ways. There's roughly 900 substances that are covered by Proposition 65. Many of them are pretty exotic, like cancer drugs. Um, but basically the rule is if a consumer or worker is exposed over the daily exposure limit, the manufacturer is either required to move the, remove the substance or put a warning on the product. So you have to get rid of it or put a warning on it. The exposure can be dermal, it can be oral, like through drinking water, or it can be inhalation. There are many other mechanisms. There are three types of exposure. Consumer exposure, exposure of a private citizen. Occupational exposure, exposure of a worker employee, 
or environmental exposure. You're letting it out, it's getting out in the air or water, like a car wash. It's a good example. One of the biggest mistakes a lot of people do because they don't, can't read the legislation properly because it's really oddly written. They believe they sell professional products to businesses that are out of scope. Occupational exposure is definitely in scope. If you expose a worker, they have the same protections. It's a Prop 65 issue. Whether it's your employee, your healthcare provider, or a high tech firm, it all counts. There is a passage in there, I'll talk about in a bit, that if it's a liquid or chemical covered by OSHA, and you, can, you have a GHS, a Global Harmonized Standard Safety Data Sheet, it's a, it is an a allowed substitute for Prop 65 warning. So if you have an occupational exposure, you have to provide a warning, of which GHS for chemicals is acceptable. If it does not have GHS, it doesn't mean you don't have to give a warning. You have to choose a different warning method. They recommend using the consumer one. You're allowed to do more things. Um, they assume that an occupational worker has a higher knowledge base, so you may be able to use other mechanisms, but you have to provide a warning if they're above the exposure limit. If it's a chemical, you can use GHS. If it's not a chemical, you still have to provide a warning. It's the way it is, and you're recommended to use the consumer. You don't have to. You can find a different mechanism. One of the things about the law is GHS safety data sheets are allowed for occupational exposure because they've ruled or decided that professional users are educated and trained well enough to understand safety data sheets. It's a good thought. I hope they do. They're supposed to be done. I would not think many of those workers can understand the safety data sheet. I hope they do. Um, it's a tough read and uh, for a lot of people. Uh, but they say a private citizen does not have the training to understand a safety data sheet. So safety data sheet is not sufficient for any consumer exposure. However, and if you get an exposure that is not covered by GHS, so it's a physical product, it doesn't mean you're out. If so many companies run into lawyers and say, no, no, we're out of scope. No, you might be lower risk because they don't prosecute professional products as often. Um, you don't have the same level of contact. You might not sell as many products. So the mathematically, your risk is, is lower. However, it's still required. Occupational exposure is definitely required for worker or employee. If you want, if you expose pregnant workers to a reproductive toxin, you also are quite vulnerable to a class action suit. Just telling you, it happens all the time. Um, what makes also this very different is a criminal, which this is, um, environmental violation in the state of California can be processed and prosecuted by civil court by private citizens. So this, and when it happens, the first notifications, the first steps of it are public knowledge. That's why we know so much about it. So normally most month, there's about 150 prosecutions a month. April had 171 notifications. That's up for normal. It's quite a lot. Uh, definitely heavily in phthalates and brass, which we'll talk about in a moment. There, there's a couple of more obscure ones. If you make a product that burns things, like charcoal or potentially medical, um, you have an energized device that might create human smoke, you have risk of carbon monoxide uh, prosecution. Uh, marijuana, for example, is allowed in California, but the smoke can still cause cancer, so marijuana smoke uh, requires a warning. Um, also, anything you deep fry, uh, French fries has acrylamide. The acrylamide is, is allowed under the FDA, but California still requires a warning. Uh, it's a great argument McDonald's had years ago. It's basically saying, look, we're below FDA limits in acrylamide. But California came back and said, look, we have our own limit. And um, can you, you know, in, in short, can you say surely that somebody doesn't eat four meals a day with French fries? Said, well, not really. So when you, when you go buy French fries in in uh, McDonald's French fries in uh, California, they have a acrylamide warning. But they actually provide a little more text to explain how it all comes about, which is perfectly allowed. Most of the prosecutions are in lead and phthalates. Uh, lead, particularly in brass, is highly soluble in human sweat. Uh, lead starts to become soluble at pH 7. When you get down to about pH 4.5 of human sweat, it's highly soluble. Believe it or not, uh, the lead comes right out in the brass components. A lot of prosecutions around uh, uh, fluids, flow meters, valves, quick connects. Uh, last month, there's one cavalry bugle, fair enough, prolonged human contact. Again, it's exposure. It has to be prolonged human contact. Tools, pliers, and calipers. There's a lot of prosecutions around chocolate. Um, it has to do... They originally blame the soil, but it looks more to do with the processing of the cocoa bean in Africa. Um, they don't use stainless steel as much, a lot of brass, as we talked about earlier. Cadmium can also be in brass. Cadmium and, and lead uh, come out in the chocolate. So we get the high-end, 85% organic, dark, good dye of a chocolate. That's what's being prosecuted, the high cocoa powder. It'll have tons of uh, lead, it'll have uh, potentially cadmium. It can also have tons and tons of aluminum, which isn't restricted yet. Um, and so 
That's fairly common. But those prosecutions make about 30%. 70% of phthalates and lead and brass. They don't prosecute lead and steel very often. It's really lead and brass. So also very much uh, for professional products are high value products, whether they're consumer white goods like fridges or medical devices. They don't prosecute the medical device because they have to acquire it. Medical devices cost money. Fridge costs money. They'd rather prosecute the accessory, the replacement cable, the hose, uh, the extension cord, uh, the valve, cheap components. Now, they often buy on Amazon have them shipped to them. A disproportionate number of the prosecutions Amazon's involved because it's also the easiest way to get the product. Amazon's got a California footprint. It allows them to prosecute easily. So if you're looking at medical devices, not the medical device of the prosecution. It'll be the breathing tube. It'll be the replacement catheter. It'll be the fluid valve as the prosecution. Uh, vinyl, consumer products everywhere. You make something that's got styrene rubber, PPC, nitrile rubber. They have a much wider range of phthalates here, including DINP, which is extremely common. Lots of prosecutions as of 2017. Tons in the cable. Again, but prolonged human contact cable. So not power cords of a fridge that stays plugged in for years. We're talking the, the ones that are connected all the time. Uh, charging cables. USB cables, extension cords, headphones. There's a little bit of prosecutions in bisphenol A, but it's very hard to prosecute bisphenol A and polycarbonate in most cases. For example, bisphenol A is about 50 ppm residual in uh, polycarbonate. Put in perspective, lead and brass is usually around 30,000 ppm, not 50, 30,000, and DINP and PVC is around 300,000. So very, very different levels. Uh, typical ones, um, so it's a brass pulley, they go right after the brass. Now, they don't actually measure exp exposure. What they do is they find the high concentration and throw the thing back to the manufacturer to determine exposure. Um, the one on the right, fluids, pneumatics, air, and gas. You make brass components for air and gas. They'll usually be leaded to, to be machined in that shape. They're human contact. It doesn't take much time for the enough lead to, to dissolve in the human sweat uh, to have an exposure issue. Easy, easy prosecutions. Especially, and they're cheaper. They often want to buy these cheap parts, not your full system, the, the replacement connector, because they want to spend the 20 bucks or 50 bucks, not the 10,000 for the unit. Again, uh, frequent prolonged human contact, headphones, both the cable and, and the inside of the headphones or vinyl. Uh, we're looking at phthalates. Um, hoses. They like hoses for everybody. Medical, um, white goods. These happen to be hoses for beer siphoning, which is an interesting target this month, but DIDP, PVC hoses, human contact, uh, insulation, easy wins. They, if you're really knowledgeable, you probably can be able to fight this one. Um, it'll often, in this case, also go after some smaller companies, but you're looking at hoses. Again, accessories. You're not looking at medical, you're not looking at fridges. You're looking at replacement hoses for fridges. Uh, vinyl gloves or, or nitrile gloves. One of the great things about nitrile gloves, they're often very heavily phthalated. Uh, a lot of medical companies have been hit for their, their gloves, not for their device, for the gloves they provide as accessories. Um, very Often very heavily phthalated, obviously very high surface area, prolonged human contact. So you can often avoid Prop 65 because you say wear gloves while using your medical device, and so anything on the medical device won't touch their skin. But if you give them gloves and the gloves have phthalates, you're on the hook for that. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty high-risk item. Again, I apologize for the speed I'm going at. Pretty well, just a tiny bit ahead of schedule. Um, IATA, lithium batteries. So, totally different topic. I apologize, I'm jumping around a bit here because we want to make sure you had at least an idea of which legislation you really should be paying attention to. And then, if you need help, we can go into a lot more detail. But if you, one of the, there are three fundamental rules of restricted materials compliance. One, it's much easier to get data before you buy something than afterwards. Number two, the restricted materials prime in a company can do anything they want as long as it's free. Third, is the things you're most likely to be non-compliant for are the things you didn't know about. And that's a big focus we're doing here. At least give you a starting point. You might be able to look into it and see if you have a risk. You can't fix everything all the time. But let's go after the big hitters. One of them is lithium batteries. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, we got lithium batteries handled. Are you sure? So this is a big thing around transportation by air. Now, we're talking about IATA, so it's air, but it's also by sea of uh, batteries. They're related to a lot of airplane airline incidents. There's been hundreds, well over 200 battery fires related to airplanes. Um, it's also very likely, looks to be the cause, the commonly held belief cause of what happened in the first uh, Malaysian airline disaster. 
when that plane went down, the first one, not the second one, that was a Russian missile. This first one, um, a lot of people in the industry are going, that really looks like a lithium battery fire. And the Malaysian Airlines came out and said, no, 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 we had no lithium batteries in the hold. Uh, the, uh, that's that's you know, rubbish. Then about two weeks later, they came out and said, yeah, we had two tons of lithium batteries in the hold. But, well, that would do it. And so what happens in the Department of Transport in the U.S. did a simulation. And so what you do is you put if the batteries normally held in a polycarbonate box. If you put a, a thermal charge or one runaway battery in the, the – it'll, it'll heat up very quickly to about 5,000 degrees C. And make sure it could be fire and such. But what also often happens is it heats up so much the deck plates expand. The deck plates expand, create a rupture. The air in the plane suddenly evacuates. The pilot will suddenly get alarmed that he has no air. He will turn to the nearest airport, which looks pretty well what they did. They will try to suck in air in the panic. There will be no air. They will expel all the oxygen in their lungs, and they'll very quickly pass out. And then the plane will fly on until it runs out of gas. So... Very serious problem, uh, very worrisome. Lithium batteries, usually not one battery is not a problem, but a couple together can take down a plane. So a lot of restrictions about it. There is a lot of detail. This is a webinar, webinar plus to explain. Simplest things, starting with you need the UN 38.3 test report on confirmation that's been tested UN 38.3. This is what you get from the manufacturer. You can't sell lithium batteries without being tested to standard. You'll be asked for this often enough. I need certification that's been tested you on 38.3. You need the proper packaging. It's got to be packaged properly. There are rules. There are different packaging instructions. It's hard to go into all that. Here, do understand that lithium batteries have packaging instructions, packing or packaging instructions. There's outer box labeling, depending on what it is and how many you have, and there are rules around it. And there's risk communication. You have to often communicate to the, the air handler or sea handler that they're there. Um, it's a great way to get a fine. You get a runaway battery, you're going to see a big fine. It's like $70,000 starting and a very, very high rate. If you haven't killed anybody, high rate. If you killed somebody, it's going to be really expensive. Um, this includes lithium batteries shipped on their own, but it also includes either packaged with your equipment or in your equipment. Like, no, we have a button cell. It's a backup battery on a circuit board. It counts. They have some reduced requirements, but it counts. It has to be tested UN 38.3. It includes button cell batteries you just have. And your air shipper will be pretty unhappy if you haven't mentioned it to them. There's a battery in there. Will it cause a fire? Hopefully not. You'd be surprised. Especially lithium battery have backup batteries on, uh, on circuit boards. So the other thing to worry about is like, hey, we do all this. Don't worry. Okay, key thing. Defective lithium batteries cannot, 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 cannot be shipped by air. Which means if you have a product return and it which has a lithium battery, if you're not sure the battery's not the cause, it can't be shipped back by air. If it has a runaway incident, it's being shipped back. If nobody dies, it's a big fine. It gets worse if something else happens. Um, and and we talked to Coach Cup. He's like, yeah, we've got some returns. And yeah, we can see the battery has got has been dissolved or gone to runaway or gone defective. Oh my God! If the airline or FAA found out, it would not be a pleasant situation. Returns cannot be shipped by air if with batteries in them, if you're not sure the battery is not the cause. You cannot ship defective batteries or air, which includes returns. So we say, hey, my product's not working. It could be the battery. If it is, it's not going by air. So you might have to get the and take the battery out first. This includes button cell batteries. A lot of the ones we're talking about uh, in these incidences, it's the button cell backup battery on the circuit board that went into runaway or corrosion or a variety of other things. Um, if you start getting smoke out of your your package and it's the battery and the airline or FedEx or UPS finds out, it's not going to be good. Burn up. <laughs> take down a plane, obviously much worse. So very serious. Some people say, yeah, we take it. How would you guys do for returns? Do the returns people know not to ship the, the, the products with batteries in them back by air? Maybe not. This is a big problem. It's a very, very serious issue. So Actually, I finished. Well, a little more time for Q&A than expected. I was moving a little quicker than I would have uh, originally projected. I wasn't really sure with all this material. And I apologize. We only went to so much depth on each. We're really talking about salient points. We're, we're you know, what's really important. When in doubt, we take care of all this. We can, we can do what we're doing today. We explain how to do it. What makes sense for your products? Um, what's the best way to be the most compliant for the least money? But what we do a lot of, and we're arguably the highest volume restricted materials test lab in North America, is we can test for all these things. It's evaluate and test. We're actually very strategic. We have some very good screening capability, which allows us to cut down the number of parts we have to test for the more exotics. And when we do test for more exotic, usually organics, 
we can be very specific and the cost for everybody is much more sensical. So we test for many cases single products both for ROHS2 and euphemistically 3, the new phthalates, uh, REACH SVHC or EU persistent organic pollutant, REACH restrictions, Prop 65, asbestos. Uh, for the medical side, the MDD and the new MDR. The new MDR is going to be really exciting. It's going to be out probably in the next 20 days. Uh, US FDA, Health Canada, and we do treatment instructions per week. You don't test per week, we do instructions for treatment facilities. But we do all these, and there's tremendous overlap. So once we're doing one, the others aren't that bad. There's a lot of overlap between the screening and the materials and the techniques. Um, so what a lot of companies do, we're not sure where we're at, we, they often have us test an example legacy product of each type and see where they're at. And then most cases, a lot of companies, once they get used to it, really just send us their new products because they're doing qualifications anyways. It's much easier to do it. It's faster. You don't have to worry about complicated data gathering and trusting people. You just send it, you evaluate it. Here's what you need to report. Here's what's non-compliant. You know what to fix. You can fix it and move on to your product launch. Um, so we evaluate and tested thousands of products. We do many, 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 many a day, super complex. We go from very simple, uh, you know, I say dollar store type, very inexpensive consumer, all the way to large, very, very large uh, medical IVD equipment. So a tremendous amount of experience. If you need help, let us help you. So I'm going to get into Q&A in a section. Second, again, anybody who attended and really large att attendee list today, it's, a, it's very flattering. Thanks, everybody. It's great to have everybody here. Um, Everybody who registered will receive a copy of the presentation. There should be a recording available online um, within uh, probably by the end of the week, if not by Monday. Uh, well, not Monday. Monday's a holiday. By Tuesday, uh, yeah, we have a holiday for a 19th century British monarch, but it's a good time of year for it. So if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the question panel. I'll try to get to as many as possible. I have a bit of a time limit today, and I apologize if I don't get to yours. Also, I apologize if I've been speaking a wee bit quickly, um, which I have been, and I apologize again. Um, just kidding. Um, so the nice thing about the recording, you may be able to then review it and, and maybe slow it down or parse it or just curse my name. All good. Um, but if you have any other questions too, and I don't get to yours right now, which I'm postponing, it's not helpful, um, I will uh, get to it afterwards. Great question off the bat. Is the Canadian interpretation of articles similar to the new EU point of view or the old EU point of view? Not sure they thought it through that well. It's manufactured item. I'm not sure it's ever gone to court in Canada. It's a wonderful topic. It could be the finished product. It's kind of just the finished product, but it's not really gone to court. Component might be a good start. Um, they also have hand wavy, wavy limits like incidental or trace. So if they use a limit of incidental or trace, then the, the size of the article really doesn't matter anymore. So we'd recommend using the European 0.15% uh, at the component level, because if their limit's incidental or trace, then the size of the part doesn't really make any difference. So it's a bit complicated. Uh, PVC contains sin, tin, so it has to have a CMRT from your PVC pliers? Theoretically, yes. However... Okay, so PVC often contains a tin stabilizer, and so therefore uh, it would have a CMRT from PVC suppliers. However, the way it's treated in practice is two pieces. Um, one, in a whether or not it's PVC or whatever, what you normally do to set yourself up is you ask your supplier. They say, no, we don't have it, tin. You say you put yourself in a position and say, I am not an expert. Is it reasonable at face value they don't have tin? It's plastic. Is it reasonable? Sure. Is it possible? Sure, they could have it, but is it reasonable? And normally gets edited out. So you normally, whatever it is, whether it's PVC or another material, you put yourself in a reasonable situation. So if you have 10, they say no, and it's a circuit board, you're going, mm, no, I can't really do that. So you have to be reasonable. You want to set a standard of care, whether it's PVC, for carbon minerals, or anything else, um, where you can make a reasonable evaluation without being an expert. Now, there's another argument saying there is a publication where some where public is written is there's a note there's a letter to the SEC says hey we heard in a phone call with the SEC that or that uh, tin organic compounds so like the the tin uh, the organo tin say in plastics is not covered it's not supposed to be covered uh, so therefore it doesn't apply it's never been a response it's it's a it's a letter about the phone, their recollection of a phone call. I would normally not base law on that. And if you look at the usages of tin in the world, about 30% of the tin usage goes into that kind of uh, region. So um, that's probably not a good mechanism. We normally recommend the mechanism saying, what's your standard of care? If you say, does that be tin? And they say, no. And 
it's not at face value obvious it does have tin, then you can exclude it. Uh, can we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, again, every, every type of person um, who registers will get a copy of the presentation. It uh, might not be till tomorrow. Um, if you don't get one, please contact me. What type of test equipment is Clegg and used to investigate these substances? FTR, XRF, great question. Lots of different things. So um, the screening, so it's, it's many different levels. Uh, the screening will often will be three things, four things. XRF, really good for metals. FTR, really good for organics. Um, some wet chemistry for surface, whether it's cadmium or hex chrome, because neither the FTR or XRF are really good at uh, surface chromates or, or in, in intermittent surface cadmium. Um, we also use evalu engineering evaluation. We have a risk base, especially for, for uh, Legislations that are declaration based, the most restriction. What this material is at high risk of having an SPHC or, or Prop 65 substance or Health Canada. And so, what, what is it? And then from that, we do other types of tests uh, GCMS. So, we don't GCMS everything, it's kind of pointless. I uh, do digestion GCMS for a lot of organics if identified by the screening evaluation methods is warranted. Um, asbestos is transmission like under a microscope uh, around Cal Prop 65, but sometimes reach its migration. Um, uh, to a variety of standards, sometimes EN 1811, depending on what it is, but for lead or nickel migration. Um, we also do, of course, food contacting, which is a huge variety of stuff. It's kind of a larger topic. So we generally use screening up front to find out, especially complex products, what substances are reasonably reasonable risk of being in them, or in some cases are, are in there because XRF and FTR are pretty good for, for certain things. Um, and use some screening and combine them with some some surface swabbing uh, wet chemistry and engineering evaluation and then do a second level on high risk we do a follow-up on very high risk materials in certain substances for uh, organics usually by gcms we have some very much more advanced rules around ppd um, there's actually a whole bunch of more advanced ways to approach ppd and screening uh, phthalates seccps etc and then we do the, the gcms for them or in some cases migration uh, asbestos transmission electron microscope for powders is a, it depends on the, uh, the specific situation. Is the may contain peanuts method workable for Prop 65 for professional workers? Yes and no. Right now, yes, it's a generic warning. In or, uh, August 30th, 2018, it has to be specific. You have to include at least one of the chemicals per endpoint. However, there are a variety of chemicals like the word phthalates. Can you use phthalates? You probably can actually, because some of the examples actually use phthalates instead of DHP. And phthalates are both reproductive toxins and carcinogens in California. So in certain cases, you may be able to use, and even after 2018, August 30, 2018, some level of genericism. Uh, right now, it's very generic. It's not a may contain peanuts, but it's a generalized warning. It may contain Prop 65 substances, substances known to cause cancer, birth defects, other reproductive harm in the state of California. After August 30, 18, it there are statements, and we'll go into more detail at some point, about... Uh, Foods has chemicals including lead, which is known to cause cancer in a state of, uh, to cause cancer. See the government website. So there is still some level of genericism even after August 30th. Oh, I went off the air. Sorry about that. Uh, Prop 7, does exposure of the subs normally contain light in a battery? Um, only if you believe so. So a worker might. Uh, there are prosecutions, believe it or not, in battery contacts. So the nickel or lead in a battery contact. We haven't seen any prosecution so far in for internal battery items. It really has to be something that could be touched to human contact. Lead has got a fairly low threshold because it's fairly soluble in human sweat. The weird thing about human sweat is if you touch a lead, it will dissolve in your sweat, and then the exposure is actually over a much longer period of time because unless you wash your hands, you have to assume that lead will eventually be absorbed in your skin. Uh, what regulation is lead and brass prosecuted? Depends. Uh, lead and brass has a, an exemption limit in ROHS, and, and there are number of brass that go over for lead. Prop 65 lead and brass is the number one uh, target. Uh, when the new medical device regulation comes about in the next 20 days and goes into effect sometime in 2020, um, you're going to have a situation where now category one, known to cause CMRs, carcinogen, mutagens, or reproductive toxins, which lead is, is, is one of those, is in the fluid or air path or invasive will have to be justified above 0.1% by weight. So suddenly all the, the brass connectors in a fluid path or an air path going into a patient, that lead will have to be justified. So you're going to see a lot more in a, in a lot more uh, diverse regulation. Can button cells cause fires? Yes, actually button cells are 
one of the most likely uh, substances to actually cause uh, child mortality. Um, they can cause fires. They are generally more likely to be smoking. Um, most times we see button cells. It's the number of factories have reported the fires. And it's usually they have circuit boards and they have defective circuit boards and they have been over a period of time. We've seen this quite a few times now. Um, realize, hey, it's the, the button cell. They pull it out and they throw it in a box. And they've been doing this for years. And then one day, all the little button cells in that box align improperly and they have a little fire on their boat. Now, is it really fire, or heavy smoking? It could be a technicality difference. Um, but the mortality, what is for children, uh, you got to be very careful. It's extremely important if you make a, or just give away, have giveaways with button cell batteries in it. What's, if a child, especially under age three, gets a hold of it and swallows it, a lot of children swallow button cell batteries, happens every day. Um, it's very cold. It doesn't really hurt them off the bat, but it usually gets lodged, lodged in the esophagus if they're too small. They only complain so much because it doesn't actually hurt them. And then eventually it corrodes. It goes into a runaway. It cuts through the uh, esophagus into the main aorta and causes uh, catastrophic hemorrhaging. Uh, happens a lot. Uh, sometimes it often gets caught soon enough. They just have to remove the esophagus, which is also pretty unpleasant. So button cells have some challenges. Uh, when shipping out of China, uh, a full test report is often needed. That's often a negotiation. China can be stricter. They will often want the test report, and it's not an IATA requirement. They'll often require the safety data sheet for the electrolyte, which is normally easy to get from the supplier. Uh, somebody's saying it's not ROHS3. I know. It's one of the fastest ways to communicate it. It's really uh, ROHS recast, including a delegated directive 25863. But it's a bit of a mouthful. So ROHS3 is one of the faster ways to communicate it. <laughs> Um, oh, there was a, a wonderful one. Great thing, great presentation. I spelled cavalry wrong. Fair enough. Unless I'm making a religious statement. Very good point. I went through spell checking. I'll have to put that back to them. It did look a little odd to me too, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Apologize, I have to leave in a moment. Uh, what special requirements for EU Pop are there for electronic product? There's no unique requirements for pop for electronics. It just applies. And when you're looking at persistent organic pollutant, you'll look at this list of chemicals, and you often get customer requests, like what's your Murex and PCB content? That's also pop, but not really gonna be a problem. Short chain chlorinated paraffins are your risk factor. Again, we're looking at the saline points. The persistent organic pollutants have a whole bunch of old school chemicals you don't normally see right now. You're looking at short chain chlorinated paraffins. Pop, EU pop, persistent organic pollutant applies to everything. So whether you're electronic or not, it, it matters. Short chain chlorinated paraffins are risk. I apologize, I drop off. Uh, I have to do something in a moment. If I didn't get to your questions, which there are lots, please feel free to contact me. Again, I apologize for how fast I'm going. I had a lot of salient points, trying to get in as much as possible. And uh, I look forward to hosting everyone again soon.